we thought we will make it through it all. Um, and uh, first up on the agenda is the phase two construction update from our um, rep, Mark Hoggett. Good evening, everybody. I want to do a screen share here real quick. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm just waiting. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, well, uh, as we do most months, we'll start off with a, a brief update on the high school. I uh, we have uh, some work taking place out uh, with respect to the east half of the site, east of the high school. You can see some uh, wonderful construction photos where the stadium has begun to get uh, uh, raised, dismantled for the parts that are gonna be repurposed in the new stadium. There's a lot of earthwork uh, taking place. Uh, here you can see in the center photo that the press box is actually being hoisted off, off the uh, bleachers there and um, uh, getting ready for, for removal. Uh, so while that work is, is taking place, our design team is hard at work with respect to preparing construction documents for the high school itself. Uh, and we hope to have uh, uh, see some tremendous progress over the next few months and, and get some GMPs lined up for, uh, for the high school. We have two more GMPs uh, for the high school that we're contemplating right now. However, we are needing to be agile with respect to changing supply conditions and labor conditions. Um, so we continue to monitor that with Rusilli and DLR uh, to make sure that we are uh, hitting the market when it's appropriate to hit the market with respect to the scope of this project. Uh, and we have been keeping close uh, with the city with respect to those developments, uh, not only those that have uh, happened in the past, but also those that may happen in the future, at least that are on our radar screen. Um, one of the things that you can see in the in the bottom right hand corner is the arch uh, with the the lions. Uh, there, Rusilli did do a pretty good job removing those lions. However, there was a little bit of damage that took place. We're currently evaluating whether they can be salvaged or not. Um, but uh, very careful attention was provided for the removal but they just were somewhat brittle. Um, so we're not sure if we'll be able to incorporate those into, into the, the project um, until after that assessment takes place. Any questions on the high school? It was shared at the city meeting last night that they were salvaged. So they, they are salvaged, but there's a little bit of damage okay. right now. That wasn't shared, so just maybe it goes back. Yeah, 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 they're sitting on site, but there's a, just a little damage that had to place. Can I also add related to the high school that we um, started today circling back on user group meetings with all of the teachers. We had a great day of meetings today showing them their spaces updated based on the last round of feedback. Um, <clears throat> we are kind of at a really critical point because of our timeline and needing to make sure we're back to 100% DD and into CD for, for all um, components of the high school that we're really at a point where moving walls and changing walls and plumbing is kind of you know, yeah. done. Now, I will say in the user group meeting today, DLR was really flexible with us and they let us make a few tweaks, um, but kind of past the, you know, it was like they were all looking at each other like, is this okay? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but because of timelines that just that sets them back in design and moving plumbing and electrical, and it's just this huge domino effect. So, you know, pretty much once we get through this round of user group meetings, walls are set, plumbing set, electrical set, you know, can't be changed. Yeah. Um, there's still yeah. room for other changes internally, like our furniture meetings won't actually be happening until next fall. Um, but we had really great meetings today. And then I was also going to share related to the high school that currently um, we have our department chairs, actually, they just wrapped it up yesterday. But over the last couple of weeks, we've had our department chairs working with all the staff in their building on um, a few different things what are the sentimental items in the building that we want to carry over that we you know want to consider to, to carry over to the new building what's the equipment in your building in your current spaces that can still be used and carried over for some cost saving measures and then what might be some ideas you have for things we might auction off or you know that other people might be interested in so we're gathering all of that information from the whole high school staff at this point also when when do you expect the user group meetings to wrap up 
for the high school. Um, for this next week, I think it are the last couple that we have scheduled, but there's some that will like linger, like we're still working on some kitchen and servery things. We've had a couple of meetings last week. We're waiting on Rotanos to get back to us on some flow things. So like the bulk of them will be done next week. We've got meetings today and tomorrow with teachers. I think one day next week, we've got some ITAB meetings next week. Um, so yeah, the bulk in the next week or so. Thank you. Anything else on the high school? Okay, moving on to the middle school. Uh, well, last month, late, late in September, GMP2 was approved for middle school East. That is the final GMP uh, for the middle school. Um, uh, the submittal process, submittals are when we get uh, the, the contractor, in this case, we're silly, get subcontractors on board and then they start submitting product data sheets and, and shop drawings that uh, affirm their commitments to what they're indeed going to be putting in the building and how it's going to be constructed. Those are typically reviewed by uh, by the architect of record, DLR. So that process has already begun, despite the fact that construction at Middle School East will not be commencing in earnest until um, uh, early 2022, uh, 23. Um, what is uh, currently being uh, considered are some alternative schedule concepts to minimize the impact to, to the school while some of the renovations are taking place. Uh, so we may see a, a little bit of a schedule enhancement from, from, from that regard, but it may prolong the duration of the project. It all, it's, it's really a value proposition between um, the school administration and, and the builders uh, with respect to whether it's 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 the appropriate thing to do or not. Um, so next month I'll, I'll be reporting on where that gets settled out uh, and whether that more benign schedule opportunity was uh, chosen or not. Um, we continue to meet with the city with respect to uh, planning and zoning and engineering and building department approvals. We actually have a planning and zoning uh, meeting scheduled for next Wednesday for Middle School East. Um, and uh, we look forward to getting getting through that step in the process. Any other comments or questions with respect to Middle School East? Okay. Uh, the elementary school. So last month I misspoke <coughs> with respect to when uh, the academic uh, portion of Blackwick Elementary will be completed. I was off by almost a month. And uh, boy, did I hear about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, that building is occupied. It's been activated. Uh, so far, it seems like the, the folks that have moved into those spaces are, are really digging it and appreciative of the work. Um, uh, the gymnasium at Black it continues to uh, uh, see some work out there. There are some, like last month I reported out that there are some HVAC equipment delays that, uh, that are posing some challenges with respect to both, both elementary schools. Um, it looks as though the schedule for the gymnasium at Blacklick is holding, but we may see some push out at High Point Elementary School. They are trying to push that back up into a turnover date of uh, Christmas break, over Christmas break. But we need to have those continue, continuing conversations and see if we can improve on what is currently showing as a January 9th turnover date for, for the gymnasium. The academic portion of High Point remains as, as reported last month for a turnover of 12-6. Um, uh, budgets are holding at this point um, for the elementary schools. But uh, a lot of good progress that you can see from these photos. Uh, finishes obviously in place at Blacklick Elementary School academic por uh, portion. And you can see some of the finishes already underway at High Point Elementary School in the academic area. And then you can see the gymnasium pretty much enclosed at High Point Elementary. At Blacklick Elementary, that gymnasium looks similar, but it's just a few weeks ahead. Any elementary school comments, questions, discussion? Okay. I would just add that the transition into the new spaces and, um, you know, there was kind of like a trickle down effect. So we moved some teachers out of classrooms and into the new spaces and then we moved, you know, second grade into old first grade rooms and, you know, to eventually get the teachers out of the modulars 
Um, so that full transition has happened. Scott and his team were a tremendous help getting extra custodial support. Um, the teachers were amazing putting in extra time to get packed up and moved. And Kristen did a fantastic job putting a very organized schedule together. So it was really successful and lots of positives coming from Black Lick. When is the, I'm sorry, when is the um, playground areas? That was a question I had received from. We're actually going to start uh, this week. Okay. This week. At both um, or just at Blacklick? At Blacklick first. Okay. And then they're going to slowly move through those areas. Um, it probably will be done sometime mid December. Okay. Um, to get everything done and implemented at the For both. For both, yes. Is, um, is everything out of the modulars now at Blacklick? Mm -hmm. I don't remember the timing. On the how long do we have those modules? December for a couple more about three weeks. Good timing. Yeah. Well, I mean we we we, we planned it out. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, you know, until she actually got in, she was She's not going. No, right. Yeah, you're, right. You're, you will not touch those until we're right. done. Right. So like they're all. So we had planned. So we've emptied them out. Great. We've actually taken oh, taken a lot of. Uh, electronics out of them uh, so that we can reuse that throughout the district. So, uh, yeah, it'll be, I think, second week of November is when they're going to start removing them. Okay. And are we selling them or? Yes, we are. Okay. So it's, it, it, we had a company that, that, because it was really hard to find a company to come in and remove the playground equipment. Mm. Um, they, there's just so much work that yeah. they, you know, to, to have them do that was tough. So we had worked out with a, a construction company to come in and remove that. And then we would sell these mm -hmm. to them. So it was kind of a, a, a little deal. bit of a barter deal okay. that we were able to get done to be able to make that work. So okay. and, it's, and it's a company that we've worked with previously. They're the ones that installed the Goshen Lane and the High Point. Uh, modulars also. Okay. So we had a we had a good relationship with them. Right. So. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, on to Black Lake Athletics. Uh, here you can see a couple of great, great photos. Uh, uh, obviously the synthetic turf field is has started to see some practice and gameplay, uh, which is what this photo is capturing. Um, lights are up and working. Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty cool atmosphere out there um, and a, a great uh, asset for the district and it will be for quite some time. Uh, the photo on the right, you can see some of the practice, one of the practice fields uh, getting irrigation and drainage. Uh, the parking lot is, is uh, getting wrapped up there. Also underway, um, softball grading and drainage and then the fencing around the uh, tennis courts started this week yeah they put the sleeves in for the yes yeah, yeah yeah so work is uh continuing on um we've got a couple of really good weather days the last uh last uh, few weeks uh hopefully we see some more today's obviously not a great day <laughs> but um from a cost perspective uh slight uptick just uh 1500 bucks or so attributed to some unsuitable soil conditions that is not the end of it. Uh, we will likely see some more, um, and, and those will uh, likely be realized by the time I give this report next month. But uh, so far, really good. Really good progress out there. Scheduled for June 30th, holding as reported last month. It's a nice little soccer game, I think, out there. Mm -hmm. Wow, oh, it's going to be that time. I know. I was going to try to get to one, but. Good job, on, every time. good job on getting the field down on time. The community was so excited and morale is really great. People are really proud. Of yes. Talking about how nice it is to walk to the game and mm -hmm. that the neighbors are decently happy. And yeah, um, yeah, uh, the students are all thrilled with the field. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of uh, very, very happy. Yeah, it was a pretty significant effort to uh, hit hit the dates that we right. were trying to hit. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. kudos yeah. to Rusilli and Scott's team uh, for for making that happen. Yeah. yeah. All right.
any other questions, comments, or discussion? The only question I have, and then I should maybe ask it when we were talking about that high school, but when is the move of the one room schoolhouse? Question. It's going to happen in the next couple of months. Yeah. Um, we're, um, we had a tough time finding how the foundation was built uh, for that schoolhouse. Um, give you a quick, we were going to jack it up, yeah. slide some beams underneath it, pick it up, transport it over to the new foundation. Um, which Rosilli is going to do, and there will be power and water to it. Mm -hmm. um, once we, the, the, the drawings were actually hit, yeah. hidden in the one room <laughs> schoolhouse. So we were calling everyone, trying to find somebody for that. So they, they, they at least put them in there. Yeah. And um, we're scared if we jack it up the way we thought we were going to do it, mm -hmm. um, that the foundation could crack. So we're probably going to meet late this week to just go through it one more time with some other things we can do to try to keep that foundation <clears throat> so that it's supported and we can move it you know be done. So. and have we found a company to come yep. in and box everything up oh uh, not to box it up they're actually they feel that if we can support the foundation mm -hmm. correctly that we might be able to leave some of the things in there As you say, and then we would move you know like anything hanging off the wall and things like yeah. that that would be small removed items. yeah like right. all the small items yeah. will be uh, inventoried and cared for and, and i it'll probably be a, a, a few groups working together yeah. To, yeah. to get that inventory and mm -hmm. stored so mm -hmm. we've also talked about i mean using some of our curriculum team members as well just because of the care that we want to be able to to you know, take with some of those items. So it'll, like Scott said, it'll be a couple different groups. And, and Sharon effort. and her team, I would, would, I'm sure, help in any Sharon way they Crane. can. Yes. Yes. So we, we actually we talked to them about some of the packages. Yeah, they, they, they didn't did, really want to be a part they, of it. They wanted to make sure they weren't left again. Well, um, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't want them to box. Yes, box yes. They were, they, and, they were like, we're not going to be they, they supervised. But they, they, they know <laughs> the really critical things, sure. right? Yeah. And so yeah. I just think yeah. that we, it's Mike Elsie, is that the guy's name? Is Jan. Jan Elsie. Jan Elsie. Yeah. He, He's been, we've talked to with Jan. Jan was the meetings. person we reached out to to try to find the, the blueprint. I would have thought that too. And, and the gentleman, he sent me to is retired now okay. and, and I placed phone calls but was not able yeah. to nice. talk with it. So all right. Well thank you for the care you're giving to that. I know it's a a local gem. All right. So yeah. that's awesome. Anything else for Mark? Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. And next I'm gonna turn it over to Scott for gosh. Uh, well, the next item, and then we'll did, did you want to go next? I'm here all night. Go okay, back. all right. All right. <laughs> I, I saw the look, and I thought, well, maybe she thought no. he was going next. <laughs> um, go you. ahead, Scott. You want to take it? I can do that. All right. Screen here real quick. While I'm doing that, uh, Joe Grady is is joining us. Joe is. Uh, Works with the district um, as, our, as our insurance broker consultant. Works with you've been working with the district for three, three years. So Joe, the, well, the last few kind of run together. Yeah. So Joe, we're at 2018. I remember well. Yeah. Joe, Joe has been with us and has helped guide us through some very difficult times. Yeah. Um, but what we what we wanted to do, um, you know, Sue represents the board on the insurance committee. We thought we'd just kind of do it, just a, a, a brief update of where things are, uh, the status of the of the, the insurance program. Um, so what I've got up here is something that Joe's put together. But we wanted to start off first, you know, talking through, you know, the role of the insurance committee. So it's in our negotiated agreements, um, but it's obviously, it, you know, consists of, of myself as the treasurer, superintendent, um, Dr. Deagle, three members appointed by her, four members from the, of the association, uh, which is the, the GGEA association, and then one member from each of the OPSI organizations. 
we have our own guidelines. Everybody serves. We do minutes. We meet at least quarterly. So we have those on a routine now. I think we got off a little bit, but obviously there's been a lot of transition in the district for a while. And we're, we're uh, reestablishing those norms and moving forward um, a little bit, just, just so everybody understands what the what the committee's tasked with. So we review the, we review the activity, review claims, um, but what the committee isn't is that they don't, you know, the state's here and they have no authority to add to, subtract from or modify any provisions of agreement, unilaterally alter plan design or set annual plan renewal rates. Um, so any recommended plan design changes are obviously subject to ratification by the various association groups and their bargaining and agreements and then approval by the board. And then we have in here at least, you know, at least once every five years that we review the services that are provided by the insurance broker, which is Ms. Joe. Um, so that's all the committee's worked, and we think you know it's working very well. But we just wanted to give the, the finance committee an overview of uh, how that's how that's working. So I'll scroll down and then turn it over to you as we talk through medical, dental, vision, and life. Okay. I will keep it very high level, but ask as much detail questions as you like as I go. Um, the medical insurance, it's come a long way from where it was at the time mm -hmm. that I got here and we had a, a mess that can stay in the past. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is, you know, right now things have been running pretty well. The district has gone to a fully insured medical plan. So you know, we were on a self-funded plan where you're paying an administrator to pay the claims for you, but you're ultimately getting billed for all those. Things. So you're you're just setting budgets. We now have a fully insured plan. They take the risk. They give us a 12-month premium. That's what we pay. If it goes way over, we're done. If it goes way under, they made a little bit extra profit. It always shows up in the renewals. So you know the good news is we've had some good renewals. Um, you know, right before COVID was when we had kind of budgeted for a 25% and we had a 30 month strategy, um, we ended up with a two and a half. So we had some extra money at the end of that year, you know, which would be the end of 21, we actually got a fully insured renewal for two years. So it was a 24 month rate. Um, you know, we go through all that in the committee and where we are and how things look. But to be honest with COVID and the past situation of the district, fully insured, it just made a lot of sense to just stay there and kind of let that ride. Um, so you're technically still in the middle of your two-year rate. So we don't have a renewal this year. We will have one for 1-124. One, one um, we have a loss ratio cap, which loss ratio is just what are your claims? What's your premium? Divide them. That's our number. So we have a cap um, and it's set. So depending on where we fall, that's our increase. Um, so it, it's nice to be able to see that coming. Um, I will say we're starting to uptick a little bit now that COVID's out and we have some larger claims that have, you know, always been in the district, but we're having a few more. Uh, so we're running about 88.3% loss ratio right now. So if we had to renew today, we'd be looking at 15% increase, but the good news is we're not renewing today. So we have another year to work through that. Um, I did make a note just because you know, the loss ratio, if you are if you are looking at the claims and the premiums, the district actually still has premiums that are set higher than what we actually pay. So even though we're fully insured and we're just paying set premiums and that's all the risk we have, we're still carrying over those old rates where we're collecting extra money. So there's about $100,000 a month of extra premium that's just being built and accumulating and it, it goes in the district 024 fund. So it is marked and set aside for insurance, but it's it's money that's being collected in addition to that. So the loss ratio will be based on the actual paid premiums to medical mutual. So just make sure you're and that and that current balance that Joe's referring to um, in that 024 fund right now is about 3.8 million. Okay. Um, so that's the medical, just quick history, dental. The district is self-funded on the dental still. Um, dental's fairly predictable. You know, you can't go over a certain amount of dental work in a year. So uh, we pay an admin fee to Delta Dental, which is $4. That did come up for an renewal for 23, but it's a 0% increase on the admin fee for, for 36 months. Um, 
you know, as the insurance committee, we, we kind of look at the funding, even though it's board money. Um, your funding is pretty much right on target with the claims and expenses. So we're getting close to where we might want to increase the rates on the dental, but I don't think we're there yet. And with COVID, we build up a lot of reserve because people could not go to the dentist, just like they couldn't go get a lot of their other routine care. So the dental has been running pretty well. You know, we've got a reserve. It's not one that we, even though it's self-funded, it's not one that we need to build up a huge catastrophic, you know, reserve for it's fairly predictable and stable. Um, and I'm going to keep going fast if you don't have questions. Go back to the medical, or do you want me to wait and ask these questions when we're all done? It doesn't matter. So my question is, I guess it was my understanding that the insurance committee was going to have a conversation about that additional, um, I don't even know how to word it, the, the additional premium that was in this is my understanding that that conversation didn't happen. So my question is, when is that conversation going to happen? Um, it's been brought up and discussed. It's, you know, the, I will say that that first, we did the 18 months and then there was that 12 month cap and we averaged it over 30 months. So that first time we had the 25% increase budgeted and we only got two and a half. At that point in time, it was, more or less decided that was already part of the bargaining agreement that we would charge those rates for the 30 months. So it was more or less just left there. Um, so that would have been the end of 21. When we were renewing for 22, we did talk a lot about that because there's a lot of extra money going in there and we're fully insured now. So you don't necessarily need to continue. A lot of extra money coming both from the employees and from the district. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the board and the employees, you're, your contracted agreement on what you, you're sharing is based on the funded premium, not the actual. Um, and so as we look at the five-year forecast is, and further in the agenda, you're, it really is going to become a critical conversation because we start negative spending next year. And if we have $1.2 million if last year, this year, and next year, we wouldn't negative spend next year. Right, so that conversation needs to take place. The other feeling I have is that I, I don't know ethically how I'm picking premium payments from employees today and not anticipating using that to pay premium for an unknown date in the future. They may be retired, they may not be with us. It is just, an ethical dilemma that I have, right? That I cannot really process any other way other than we need to we need to address this both the lump sum that's sitting there and and what's happening going forward. Yeah. Um, because there, there's right now there's just not a an end game that uses that money with a date certain. So. I, from a fiscal responsibility, I, I am struggling with that scenario. And the, and the timing of your question is perfect um, because the, the staffing said we're going to get into the five year forecast. So there's really two things going on here that are all inter, inter, you know, intertwined here. We've got the renewals that we, what we have on the board agenda for Thursday is the dental vision life. No increases, those are easy. But if we're going to do something with medical, we need to talk about that. And if we're going to do something different, that could have, well, not could, it will have an impact on the five-year forecast. So if, if that's, you know, what I'm hearing the direction here, I think that's something we need to take back to the insurance committee, which meets on November 14th. So we would, we would take that as a, as a task that we go back to the insurance committee, have that conversation. Timing's going to be real tight because what we'll do is then the November this meeting in November will be a, an update to the forecast if it's needed, which I would say results of that would dictate that it's needed. So we meet on Monday, right? right. Meet on Monday with the insurance committee. Tuesday, come back here to finance and facilities with an updated forecast if there is a change. And then on Thursday, the board will be presented with the five-year forecast for approval that we would submit to ODE by the end of November. So it's 
it's, you know, we're a very, very critical time now, but it's, it's the perfect time to, to do that. Because there's a lot of ways we could achieve the same result, whether we decrease premiums, whether we do, um, you know, premium holidays, things like that, that we could look at to, to address this and fix it. Right. Thanks. I was on vision. So vision's fully insured. We pay the premium to VSP. Um, we had an agreement that went to get us to January. It just ended. So, you know, we are looking at a renewal. The option was pretty simple. We could take a slight decrease or we could upgrade the benefit just a little bit, keep the rates the same. Um, so that was discussed in committee. Everyone liked the new benefit. It's just the blue light lenses. So it's really nice for a family that may have the vision, but only one or two people in the family wear, you know, prescription lenses, they can at least do the computer classes. So um, that went through committee. The life insurance, the only real update there is Ford did change the insurance carrier back in July. Um, and because of the timing, when that changes in July, the board paid life insurance, switched to the new company, all the voluntary life that the employees have paid and, and buy on their own. We kind of leave that the way it is because it's very hard to do a transition in July during the summer. Um, so that's going to take place during open enrollment. They'll be able to make new elections, buy more insurance if they want to, those kinds of things, and it'll be effective January 1st. So um, that is really the, that's my update. Open enrollment is coming, so that's a lot of work in the treasury. Uh, open enrollments is um, October 24th through November 16th. So we're getting those dates out. Folks are signing up. They've got to meet with the broker of uh, American Fidelity to go through that election process. Um, but I, you know, I want to say, I mean, just, just in the short period of time, I mean, it feels like a long time, but the short period of time that I've been here, like we've, we've addressed a lot of insurance. Like we've we switched life insurance, we saved money, increased the benefit and addressed some compliance issues that we had. The dental piece, you know, 0%, you know, the rate three years is great. Wow. And then the vision, we kept the rate flat and increased benefits there. I mean, that was, that was huge. Now we've got, we've got the big ones still to deal with. Uh, but I think we've got a, got some direction uh, that we need to follow through on, bring that back to the is there any additional direction that you need from the board before having that discussion with the insurance committee? Do you want to talk about the approach? About this? I mean, we've, uh, I mean, one of the things that we've talked through that, how long we have that on there? Um, you know, does every but you understand the difference, the we, risks we with have, the fully insured versus the self-funded? Okay. Okay. I don't, but then I don't know. Are there choices to be made as to how to have this approach the what's that? I had this conversation before, but it was with before the new board, is that right? right? And that's honestly, as the new person on the committee, decisions that should have been made last year were not made. Yep. I mean, in complete transparency. Yep. And we have to make them now. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so the so, answer to the question then is because these three have haven't had that. Um, I think they need they they should have that information before. I mean, the difference between like yeah. fully insured and self-insured and the pros and cons of each and and maybe some of the history I think would be helpful because Daphne and I know but there's no way that you would know any of that well and I mean part of it we we received updates on the the issue which Joe addressed is that we didn't really adjust the premiums so like why do we still have the building right you shouldn't have that, right? Right. But it's because, and, and I get it to a certain extent because you have people concerned of, you know, lowering rates and then raising rates, but it still doesn't address what's the financial implication of that. So I understand it from a personal standpoint, yeah. what people think about paying, but you have to understand it in context of the big picture. I and think I think that's the part that's been missing is the financial impact to the district 
yeah. with what has happened. Well, I also think that there wasn't ever consensus about whether there was a desire to go back to being self-insured. Right. That that there was there were there are some people who I believe, and I don't want to misstate. I mean, I'm here. I'm not on insurance committee, so I don't hear any of this firsthand. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that there are some people who would who desire to go back to being self-insured and there are some who do not. And so right. at the end of the day, we're charged from a financial fiduciary responsibility, yeah. right, as the board. The board, the board is. And yeah. honestly, from a plan perspective, nobody should care if we're self-insured or we're fully insured. Mm -hmm. They should mm -hmm. care about what premiums are paying. Right. And, and the benefits that and come the benefits with it. that come with it. Mm -hmm. And we have to be charged with financially, how do we make that work? And I think that's where we've gotten derailed a little bit is people are trying to direct yes. how it happens right. and they shouldn't have to worry about that. Right. Right. We should be working on the best plan possible with the best rates given current environment and benchmarking what is out there. Because I think that's also a lack of understanding that people have is yes. what is the market and what's really out there that's um, from a benchmark standpoint um, that people are paying um, and what's happened with COVID and the rates. So I think that's a, there's an educational part of getting everybody on the same page with yeah. what that looks like, yeah. which I think might actually be the harder piece to get everybody on the same page with. Yeah. And I think what may be harder for Pearl and I is we know that the rate, the premiums were raised to include a debt repayment right. Right, uh, portion right. because when the health self-insurance fund went bust, we had to borrow $2 million. Right. And so part of the premium was for that repayment. Right. Well, that has been repaid, but the premiums weren't suggested. Right. Right. And so as a district, we pay 80% of the premium. Right. It is really negatively affecting our financial condition. Yep. So the, that's where, especially for the start of 2022 is really when it hit. Right. Um, in January. Right. Yeah, so, that's kind of that first, that first piece we really need to, to look at is to, to stop that overfunding mm -hmm. immediately. Um, so we need to, to look at that. And then, then the conversation goes into looking at that 3.8 million that's there. What do we do with that? How and when could that be used to bring the holidays, buy down the rate, if you will, as we look at the next renewal, which would be in January 24. And there are going to be some options there that we can do that. But we, we, need, to, we need to stop that. We need to stop it. Right. So, so Scott, you will reach out to the insurance committee and let them know what to anticipate for the next meeting based on this conversation, yes. right? And then during that meeting, you'll outline the status of where we are and provide some options moving forward to ensure that we do reach that premium reduction of some sort, correct? Mm -hmm. So that then we can come back to the board in November with the update. Correct. And and Scott, I know you and I have talked to you, you will make yourself available to anyone on the insurance committee well, to absolutely. have a conversation with you mm -hmm. should they have any questions or concerns and they absolutely. do know how to reach out to Joe as yep. well for the same. So I, I really feel that um, based on this conversation and, and what you and I have talked about, we have a great plan moving forward Good. to ensure that everyone has the same information can make the appropriate decision. I, mean, I, I would envision this being the agenda item for November. I mean, your dental vision, like right, the, they're, they're set. set. So, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll obviously give them the standard quarterly reports, but that won't be the focus of the conversation. Right. This will be it. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll follow up with an email tomorrow um, let them know what happened tonight with the questions for to be prepared, you know, to come come prepared, ready to discuss. The thing. I think there was going to be a case study kind of put together about the the issues of self insurance versus the pros and cons, pros yeah. and cons, mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think there might be people, new pe new people on the insurance committee that weren't around yeah during twenty seventeen. Um, that we need to oh, make we sure. One, we have yeah. new ones now, but a couple. Yeah. But they, yeah. There could be could be a big turnover from from then. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like we need to educate them as sure. and, and so that they feel 
so that well, then, then they, can, they can they can answer your answer questions of their of their membership. Sure, right. absolutely. Yeah. Right. I think right. where premiums are listed on our docs, is there anything that has like deductibles and other details around the plan? None of none of none of um we do have those and we actually send those out for the open enrollment piece. Um I it's don't, one of them. Okay. Yes. Isn't it in one of the uh, open enrollment yes. docs emails that we got that went oh, this yeah, 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 right. yeah. 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 Um last week's um because we're sending uh, oh, we sent an email last week, this week, and then a, a the last two weeks got here, get the final one this week. Um, it has the benefit, the benefit summary. The plan yeah. design, the plan design I, itself, that none of that will change. We're just talking just the just the premium piece. because mm -hmm. uh, whatever that is, we're picking up 80%. The employees are picking up 20. So we need to right. Yep. right. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Joe? Scott, anything else to add on? So that probably answered the question that we had to the forecast about the insurance piece. So I think we're, we're good there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. You, you are more than welcome us. to stay, but um, that's me and White Leaf. <laughs> yes, you will. I'm going to sneak home. <laughs> okay. Please do. Thank you for coming. Okay. Item three um, or four is um, special education staffing. So, yep. Joe. So last month, Sue Wigging and I were here at Finance and Facilities Committee meeting to talk about two additional educational aids that were needed. Um, in that conversation, we talked about how sometimes these needs arise throughout the year because of you know a fluctuation in um, student enrollment, students' IP needs. Um, sometimes we get those students that come into the district with one-on-one -on -one support in their IEPs. We talked a little bit about that process. Um, and those educational aids were um, being brought on to support at Royal Manor and Lincoln Elementary um, and are the two FTEs that you'll see on the agenda for this Thursday's board meeting. At that meeting last month, we kind of foreshadowed a little bit about um, an additional um, need that had been, had been surfaced at the high school. Um, and so that is a 1.0 FTE educational aid ask for supporting our structured support unit at um, the high school. Um, this, this need stems from um, student needs. There are currently 14 students now, um, nine students with autism, and um, the other students are OHI, which is other health impaired. So technically it's a cross-categorical type of unit, um, but there are different cap sizes. Um, six is actually the number for students with autism. So because it's a Cross cat, we're allowed to go a little bit higher, but based on the needs, that sometimes you know determines the amount of support we need to be able to provide. And you know, some of the information Sue has shared with me is that it also gets challenging to be able to support students out in their inclusion classrooms across four grade levels as well. So um, this is a need um, that they've been talking about for a while. And actually, in our user group meeting today, the the structured support teacher. Was asking about it and Sue said, Yep, we're going to be talking about it at finance tonight. So that is actually um, a 1.0 educational aid increase to support that unit. We thought um, that we were not going to need to actually request this particular position this evening because um, the student that we were bringing a one on one aid in to support moved out of the district, but another one moved in. <laughs> oh. So we thought it was going to be a wash for us, but that didn't end up working out. Um, so explain that to us this morning in cabinet. Um, there's also a 0.85 occupational therapist need and a 0 0.20 physical therapist need. Um, and those are related services that are um, included in students' IEPs. Currently, our OT caseloads are over the maximum caseloads at, at both preschool and school age. And so Sue believes bringing on that additional 0.85 is going to be able to meet those needs as well as support the students that are being evaluated right now and will likely be qualifying in the next few weeks. Um, the same type of situation with PT, um, it's an increase of a, a 0.2. We actually have a current physical therapist that um, works part-time with us, so she's able to, to add that additional point to, to support us for, she is at her max, um, and there are additional students, you know, being evaluated for those services, and and um, so Sue believes that the point two will be able to, to fit our needs and get us through the rest of the school year. 
I do want to say that in the five-year forecast that you know Scott's going to be talking about, we have already worked these positions in because we we believe they're long-term needs. Um, also, though, wanted to provide a little bit of foreshadowing um, that if preschool enrollment continues to increase the way we're seeing it increase, we're anticipating needing a 0 0.5 in January for preschool um, and an additional 0.25 SLP to support those IEP needs for preschoolers. So that's just, you know, enrollment will tell just a little bit of foreshadowing on Sue's kind of predictions based on what we typically see. Um, so those are those are the positions. So what would you need in January? A 0.5 teacher okay. to open another um, half day. Okay. And okay. then um, a 0.25 speech, SLP, speech and language pathologist. And, and you know, the preschool has different operating standards than, than our school age programs. Um, and many, a majority of our students with IEPs at the preschool level get speech, get OT, get, you know, they, they need those services to support them. they're there, right? Yeah. Are those positions for January in the five-year forecast too, or because, okay. Yep. So when you sit on the PT, you already have somebody that's part-time that can absorb the additional that can oh, can increase her time with increase that. that and day. is the OT related to the OT that is not working? Don't, don't we have an OT that was on leave? This is in addition to. Okay, that. so this is it. So this is when that person comes back, we still we have still. a need on top of that. Okay. And do we look at contracted services for that instead of full time? Yes. Yeah, my under, I, I believe Sue hasn't been able to find anyone yeah, yet. Particularly for some coverage, we have tried yeah. and not had any luck. Interesting. But we do, she does look at contracted services. Yeah, just to, as things are going up and down versus hiring a full-time person in. Yeah, wait until you get closer to 1.0. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking with um, that. But sometimes it's not beneficial cost-wise because it, costs more to bring right. in a private provider sometimes yeah, because they're charge charge oh sure yeah. sure mm -hmm. so so those are the the needs but I will say and we'll talk about it when we get to the five-year forecast we tried to do some modeling based on our enrollment projections um, to help us from being in this mm -hmm. position in the future you know or continually needing to come back and, and ask for for more staff Thank you. Mm -hmm. You guys keep track of a lot. <laughs> yeah. I was I wanted to share also that we have been working on that enrollment trend analysis oh, yeah. spreadsheet. Um, I actually do have it printed out. It's really small. There's a lot of oh, on it. Um, I might have to increase my menu. I know. Yeah. But we decided today that we wanted to also add um, our aid staffing count in there. So that data point's not in there yet. So it's not quite ready, but um, that, would, that would be a very good add. Yeah. To have that in there. Yeah. So we have the last five years, our general education um, enrollment, and then we've broken it out by EL. And then we've done all of our subgroup, um, you know. Mm -hmm subgroups for special ed, so general intervention, ELSS, ESS, FSS, BSS. That's great. That'll be nice. Just, I think, for us to see, yeah. the, right, surely the, the yeah. salaries and that line have increased, and that'll give it context, I think. Yeah, well, I was, to that context um, point, there, it's, there's, there are so many intricacies to the staffing in our district. So, for instance, when you look at you know, we've got K-5 staff for this year, 160 teachers, but that doesn't include, like that's certificated general education classroom teachers, but that doesn't include our art teachers, our music teachers, our, oh, wow. you know, there's so many other staff that support that, you know, number of kids, that group of kids, um, you know, the same thing for um, the high school, right, where we have um so many different electives and stuff. So the numbers are the numbers, but there's more to the numbers also. Yeah. It's not everyone because for instance, we wouldn't necessarily, if, if we got 25 more kids at the elementary level, that would warrant another classroom teacher, but it wouldn't necessarily warrant an additional related arts teacher. So when you get the spreadsheet, know that there's, this isn't all of our staff and all of, you know. Well, and then you have, 
like you said, all of the aides, you have all the instructional coaches. I mean, it's it's a layered a big organization. Yeah, it's a layered impact of you know what enrollment does, right? Yeah. And have the increases. Mm -hmm. Thank you for working on that. Yes, yeah, thank you for us. Mm -hmm. That'll be very enlightening. Lots of people. It's exciting about his growth. It's exciting. Are we still enrolling in the preschool or are we? Oh, yeah. I was just talking with someone yesterday. People come on the lab. So, yeah. Are we, are we both students that need to be and required to be there and the peer model? Peer models. Both. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know if we're capped out at peer models right now, but as we add more sections, then we you know, would certainly be bringing more in. Mm -hmm. I don't know the specific numbers right now. We have more flexibility in the ratios now as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. I think we have more flexibility in the ratios oh. now. So it, it's not a requirement to be sure that we stay within 50. That's been relaxed a little bit. Oh, interesting. Okay, good. good Thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. Next up is our September financials. Okay, we're going to try something just a little different. I tweaked this a little bit, so we'll. I like it. Let's Sue, Sue smile there, so I think she she noticed that. So hopefully that was a good thing. <laughs> um, so I just wanted because typically we, I've been, this is a long move, I know that, um, but I've been looking to make some changes with this, and there's going to be some more even coming next month as we get into um, construction funding updates and a financial report that we'll embed within this. Um, but what I wanted to do is what I'll show you here is not exactly. It, page for page what's in the report it's this is just the presentation piece uh, but in the report what you what you have is I put together some highlights of what I what I would classify as three major funds the general fund the PI fund and then the, the bond issue phase two funds um, so what I what I did there's I went we'll go through and we're looking at what are what are the major contributors to the activity for the month so you'll see on the revenue side for the general fund just under 4.6 million dollars the taxes for the homestead rollback exemption that the state pays on behalf of, of the homeowners was $3,284,887.77. Our state funding that we received was $1,102,000. Do you have this oh. on a slide by any chance? I, the report's on there, but I'll, oh, okay. it's not, I don't, I, have, just, I don't have it on the slide. I just I'm thought sorry. we were trying to find it. So no, it's, yeah. I, I got you. Okay. Um, okay. The state funding was uh, $1,102,879.88. And this is one that's, this is good now. Interest rates have gone up. So we actually have real interest earnings now as opposed to what, you know, 0% that we used to have 0.2 for interest, interest rates. Uh, interest for the month of September was $101,895.86. So for the general fund, um, expenditures for the month, we're 25% through the fiscal year. Um, we spent 9.3 million. Um, when comparing it, when we looked at those total expenses, we spent 23.89 percent of our budget. So we're pretty close to if we spent equally across the fiscal year, um, which we all know no fiscal year is just like the other, which we'll see in the slides. That you can see what the changes are. And we ended the month with the uh, fund cash balance in general fund 57 million 427 thousand 599 dollars and 72 cents. On well, the permanent improvement fund, the same taxes that we talked about in the general fund, it's just the PI's portion of the homestead uh, exemption was $29,567.09. We spent $218,273. The majority of that were for new buses, which were $197,990. And ended with an ending cash balance in the PI fund of $8,064,686.92. Interest earnings on the construction fund, um, great, great information, $202,565.84. And I did put just a little bit of the update from where we were to where we are now. In 2000, since 2021, the yield went from 0.52% to 1.97%. Um, the average commercial paper rate on the new purchases that we've invested in is 4.24%. Great numbers from where we were. Um, on the, the COPS issue or the certificate of participation, the yield went from point from 0 0.86 to 1.62. The average commercial paper rate of the purchases with, with the COPS proceeds is 4.1%. Um, so it's 
moving in a very, very good direction that we need. Um, so hopefully it's, those. But, it's the irony, right? right. Like we, right. we went to the motors. We went to the motors in <laughs> November of twenty. We were able to lock in right before right. our 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 debt rates, right before rates started to go up. Right, and now because of the lag in building, we're hopefully going to reap some benefit. But that'd be nice to have a little a little relief to balance out the all yeah, of the, the supply chain issues. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the, the expense for the month were um, two million seven hundred ninety three thousand one hundred fifty nine dollars and four cents, and you could see what the what the locations were underneath the breakdown for those, and then the ending cash balance for the bond was two hundred thirty one million six hundred forty two thousand five hundred sixty dollars and thirty five cents. It seemed like the expenditures, and I know we hit on this in another meeting, are low in comparison. So there's a lag with how bills are getting submitted. Yeah, and the and the big expense mm -hmm. of the of the issue is right. the high school. Right. So that's you're we're gonna have the big chunk at the end of the project because right. that's yeah. that's where the you know the biggest expense of that is. Um, but yeah, we are working with the contractors. I mean, it's we want that we want the work done as quick as we can, and we want bills turned around as fast as we can so we can spay it, pay it as quickly as we can because we want to make sure that we we get the draw. Oh no, on yeah, the and I I see that, but even like the blacklist. Athletic complex was only being one hundred and seven thousand. I mean, things that we've seen more completion on, you don't really see the expense coming through. So, more from a timing standpoint, right? Absolutely. They're just yes. Fine. yes, yep. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to work from here, but I'm going to switch up to the screen so you can see just a little bit of what what I've done for the presentation. Um, and I think as we start putting this information. Um, online and available mm -hmm. folks will see the presentation and the accompanying report with it so they'll get to see both both pieces of information um, which i think will be good so this is the one page report that we've we've talked about um, this is the monthly variance report uh, the big pieces here was that we were projecting you can uh, blow that puppy up right oh, oh oh yes i can sorry look, 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 good, look good in front of me okay. not really yeah. <laughs> it's like dots right now. <laughs> the layer for what you're um, okay. Just get that. I'll leave it on the monthly actual piece so you can yeah. see on the screen what's there. Okay, but I'll talk from my from my slides here, my, from my sheet. Um, the property tax settlement, the second half settlement, because we looked at six years of actual data of when those payments came in. Um, using that methodology, we were projecting um, to receive those payments through November, through October and November. We got the final settlement in, in August, so that, that was good. Casino revenue came in uh, at the end of August. So this is not necessarily the monthly actual information, but it's since that screen is so large now, the fiscal year to date piece is over on the right. So our unrestricted grant in the aid is number is up because of the casino revenue. Um, we did receive the property tax allocation that I had that I talked about um, for all the funds in September and the TIF revenue that we had received in August as well as what driving up the revenue pieces. Um, I am going to go back because I just I did want to talk through these slides as we because you know, this is some of the information I think that will be helpful because um, we've talked a lot about what we'll get into that, that's really but it's moving slower than my fans and my hands and I can see off the side. Um, so this first graph just looks at the revenues um, which is showing up in the, the blue, um, the orange color if you will is the expenditures and then the cash balance. So you can see where we're getting these major influxes. Of, like I said, August is when we got the second half property tax settlement. That's why the number is so large. Um, and then it's it, you don't see it going forward. We'll see it again um, in March when we get to the first half settlement in calendar year 23. So a lot of things that we've talked about, and I thought this would be a good way to kind of represent that, is um, timing issues. So what I'm thinking of what I'd like to do and get, get your feedback on this is bring this forward. So each month you're going to see projected versus actual. So this is going to update each month so you can see where we thought things were going to come in and where they actually did. So you can see here looking, at, for example, at the property tax in July, the actual was nothing because we didn't get anything until we got the final settlement, which was in August, which is why the number is so high. Um, so 
So we had projected to receive it some payment in July. We didn't get it. So that delta you will see on top of what the projected was. That's why we got the full settlement. So you can see what some of these timing issues are. Uh, so we move into the tangible personal property tax. That one's following this, following where we thought it would be. And there's there's always always going to be variances. Um, it's never going to be exact until we get into like advances out because that's easy. We do it June 30th. Look at unrestricted grants and aid. Um, as I mentioned, that casino payment that was here, that would explain part of that delta. It was just a little bit higher. And as I said, these from October on, those are all flatlined because there's there's no actuals yet. So that you're going to see each month, one month pop in. Restricted grants and aid, that's exactly what we want it to look like. We want the projected and actuals to be spot on in an ideal situation. Um, those are right where they're right, exactly where they're supposed to be. I'm struggling a little bit. Like I get, I understand the value of seeing the timing. I'm, I guess I'm struggling to understand. I understand the two lines, but I don't know what, why, how. The, 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 the impact isn't really that great. It's yeah. just timing disconnects, right? Mm -hmm. From it's, when you plan it versus right. when it comes in. Right. I don't know how it's to just, articulate what I'm trying to say, but I'm not sure that this is showing the important thing. Well, I think I think this, I guess these slides are just to show that piece, but the yeah. important thing is still this, right. this right. document, because that's showing the, the delta in terms of dollars and percents. I like think this still to me. Year to date, this, and year, sure yeah. Yeah. year to date, maybe that's more than, maybe yes. that's been a single okay. month. Yeah. Maybe yes. that's all that. Yes. Is. Yeah. I mean, I think showing the timing is important to see. I'm just not sure that showing the difference, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it is. I mean, the only thing that you would see on this is to say it. when you see the next influx right. as expected, I mean, that's really what it's showing, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You're seeing the variance and then you're saying, okay, when is the next expected revenue? You really aren't expecting it until yeah. much later. I mean, from a budgeting right. and planning standpoint. Yeah, like, I mean, this, this... we don't get to that level. We don't. And I, yeah. I mean, he yeah. needs to know. Yeah. It. Right. When, yeah. yeah. And, and if this isn't helpful, that's okay. That, that's okay. Because I want to make sure that what I'm bringing forward, I don't want to, I, I don't want to bring think, too many slides to the waste yeah. time. But like the property tax allocation is a good one because it, yeah. it all came in in September. Yes. Right. Where, right. where what, there was no payment in July, there was in August. So right. there's that, there's that little bit of change. So it, you know, like I said, I think the highlights and I think this, the, this is the key document. Right. Um, I probably, yeah still put this there if somebody want to go look at it it's just there but we, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time looking yeah, at these right. if i think part of it to. is too that it's just such a short period of time that it's only three months yeah right and and the other part is you don't have control over when the auditor sends you money i know right? that's what i'm right. concerned about i think that's what's going through my head is it makes it appear as though that the fact that your projections and the actual are different like that makes to me that feels like that's a problem and i don't i think that's not what you're trying to illustrate no, 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 no. we don't have control over that right? right but i don't think that's Clear. We want to. It's not just a time. We want that's to sure, exactly my but, concern. But, but I want to make sure that what I'm projecting and the actuals are mm -hmm. close. Right. Sure. That's over the sure, period over of the time. period of time. I want to make sure that it. I want. I want to know. I want to make sure it's not just right. Not that. Issue, See that, that there's something that else. That disparity between the just in the month of September. Like to me, that looks like something's wrong, and that's not what you're trying to communicate. Correct. Because yeah. that that. This this gap here, I think, is what you're talking about here. Yes, is because of in the, the past timing. we received right money. We projected so what you really want to see is at the end of the three months, are we ahead yeah. of what we expected or not? I mean, that's what I would want to know. So maybe that's a, maybe that's another way. Now now I'm going all yeah. You know, well, that's what I that's what I would need because I could, could change this and do this at a quarterly do yeah. this at a quarterly snapshot. Yeah. gets away from these that right. it's more of a i'm sorry i'm going away in my nerd brain here you know more of a, a, a bar chart to say here's what we projected and here's how close it was on a quarterly basis right. so maybe that's where yeah. we still do this but then really yeah. kind of get in this more on a quarterly basis perfect yeah. I like this exactly. quarterly report for are you saying are you concerned too that we put this online 
we want to be transparent, but without context, right. people could interpret. Yeah, I mean, that looks, gotcha. like yeah. I said, that looks to me like right. there's a problem there that we have some ability to fix. And number yep. one, there's not a problem. And number two, that has nothing to do and with you have no anything we have control over. Right. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll put on the, I'll, I'll jump yeah. through this. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit to the um, pieces we do control. Mm -hmm. So this is where I've added detail behind each of these, because if you look at this, it's the expense side, because the revenue side, it's it's math. It's your property values, it's your tax rates, it's the state funding formula, it's it's just, it's the it's the math. Mm -hmm. So the personal service, this is salary and wages. Um, there, there was a delta here in July, um, and in my note, I, I put that in there because there were, there were, there were ESSER expenses. There were folks that should have been charged to the ESSER grant <clears throat> that were charged to the general fund grant. So we had to make an accounting adjust correction in the month of July. Um, it was $714,736.63. Still, still charged within the grant period, still charged the appropriate place, but where it would have shown up <clears throat> as a general fund expense, it was charged off to the grant. So that's why the actual is less than what the projected was because of that that move to get the fund, get those expenses um, allocated to the correct funding source. And that reflected here yeah. with your note, right? Yes. And so when you do that, when you look at the overall expenses, we're at 2.67% under budget, which is right where we want to be. You know, if we're, under, if we're within 3% underspending, I look at that and I'm very happy that that's where we are. I'd love it to be 1%, but I'm going to take three. You know, that's just, that's, that's what I am. But then what I did below this, I went I went deeper into it because then I pulled out all of the object codes, um, everything that makes up our personal services. And then I went through and said, here's the sum of what we projected to spend based on that, that six years of actual data, compare it against what we spent, and then show you what the variance is on a dollar amount and a percentage. So we're, we're, we're okay, everything's... Um, in, in line with where they need to be. There are going to be some variances because we're comparing against some COVID years. So when we're looking at things like temporary salary for SARS, overtime, it, it throws that off because we've got some anomalies in that six years that just are, are never, hopefully never going to repeat themselves. Um, so we go into the, the retirement, the insurance benefits, the same thing. And then we also get um, what that, where those deltas are against that projected spend that we had. So these are all these are all tied to the people. So when we get into the, the budget, the operating piece, because um, I know we, we've talked about this last year, um, especially about the equipment. Equipment looked like it was under, that was a piece where technology had money allocated for computers that we, we purchased out of ESSER. So that was, a, that was an explanation there. So this is where the timing pieces really can get a little funky. Um, it's just depending on what we're buying, when we're buying it, when the things get delivered and paid. Um, we know that we're paying people two, you know, twice a month. That's easy to do. But the timing of these large expenses can change. So I've done this and it probably looks really small on that screen as well. But it breaks down um, all of those, those categories within purchase services. And again, overall, we're under 2.68%. We're under 3%. We're I'm comfortable with that, so we're not we're not digging into that too much too much deeper. Three percent, because I this, was, I we're under by three percent on the salaries. Is that what no, you're saying? I'm purchase or, services. Oh, yeah. on the salary page on the top right, where it says minus seven point two eight percent. That's, that's does that mean that's that's under because we had yeah. some of the ESSER expenses okay that were moved that would have shown up in here so oh. the salary the salary number would be five hundred forty one thousand okay. higher okay than what's reported here because we moved them off you the general fund said that but I'm that's okay. Okay. Oh, maybe. Yep. So, all right thank you so on the supply piece we had some variances there you can see that the actual was a little bit higher. So we wanted to see what those were. So there were three categories that I highlighted in yellow here as being, not that the budgets were wrong, but this again could be just a, a timing issue because we have the internal controls in place that they can't spend more than what they have budgeted. So it's classroom supplies, software materials, and then as everybody's outfilling their, you know, their car, 
fuel should not be a big surprise. Right. Um, and we're also very good at sticking to our budget. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Kudos to you. <laughs> so that should, over time, even out a little bit. Capital outlay, um, again, we're, we're way under in July. August was pretty close. September's up a little bit. Um, but again, the, the difference was um, the underspending there was it was in technology. So we're, we're, we're digging into those things to figure out what those what those items are that we could be yes, there again, right? And it, right. And it could be pieces of, of, of that. Yeah. So that's that's where I broke it down a little bit further on the expense side, because this is where we really can make change, right. um, impact that, impact the cash balance. The revenue is really what the revenue is. Um, and we can invest a little bit differently, but we're not going to see massive changes. But this is where we're monitoring this and looking at it from a more of a behavioral standpoint. If you go back to the benefits first, I, I know with the moving of the salaries, you would have moved the portion of the benefits as well, Correct. but then, then there's a large increase in the line that I wasn't expecting to see, which is the SERS. Yeah, the employer share. So I was trying to figure out what would have happened that caused that individual line to go up. It may have been from... Um, the administrative packages. Steve's retirement. No, it would have been shifting no. the administrators. Oh, yeah. the realignment. Yeah, because, yes. Because yeah. when you go back, oh, okay. when you go back and look at that six-year trend, it wasn't okay. that that share wasn't always there. So again, yeah. that's that's skewing off that that trend number that was used projecting S's forward. People like Scott, yeah. Matt, you know, right? That aren't in STRS. So if you look at STRS, it went down six point. Because that would have been the share going with the people that like got charged to ESSER, right? So you would you saw the corresponding movement of the benefits piece to ESSER, right? Well, we're well, saying people that were used to be have this their retirement STRS moved to SERS. Is that right? No, 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 no. It was the pickup, and one one of the other things we want to do too is the way that the the, the way that the allocation for budgeting purposes was done. We want to make sure that the, that the budget was put on the correct line. Um, it's the okay. Romberg study and the yeah. okay. realignment of the benefits packages. And okay. And we have different classifications of employees, some pay into STRS, some pay into SERS. But wouldn't we have budgeted that way? No. It's supposed to be. It, <laughs> If that was that was the in, in, I was looking total, at it from I just a budget sure we make sure, We're going to dig in to make sure that they're It'll all in the right spots. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. That that will make sense. It's transition year, right? And I don't know if STRS the decreases because of some of our higher paid administrators retiring and bring. I, I don't. I mean, I don't really know. I'm just speculating, possibly. That, yes, that could have an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, surprising. Uh, Right. So we can see so that then this one's pretty close. The, the can I ask a question on the last section. What would be touch. <laughs> what would be <laughs> under reimbursements on that category? Yeah. Like what are some examples? It's kind of in the middle. Like tuition reimbursements? No, I was looking at that, but Two lines down, other reimbursements and fringe benefits. What are some samples? I was just curious. That one is probably um, there are allowances in employment um, agreements that provide for cell phone reimbursements. That's what I was going to say. Fringe benefits. That would. That would. That's what. what that's so we, we thought that, that would like that for. Uh, no, those would be those have a separate one. So um, cell phone reimbursements are. Paid to, to staff. So instead of doing it through an accounts payable, we add it to their payroll and it becomes a taxable benefit. So the tax is taken out. So that's what that line would be used for to pay those, those cell phone reimbursements. And their fringe benefits like training or travel or? No, I, I this is just that's the description of the line, but I, I believe so. that's okay. what that is used for. That's a good catch. So I will tweak this report to do it more on a quarterly basis to get down into the details on this. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Be, yeah. Lost, in the, lost in all of the discussion is the fact that we're 7.8% higher in revenues year to date, yep. right? Yes. And 4% um, under in expenditures. And if we and if we take out and if we take out that that accounting adjustment for the ESSER funded positions, we'd be at two point six seven percent. Right. So we're a we're a great right. we're a great. Spot. So our run rate's good. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yep. And we've only added positions that are going to enhance the operations of the district and required based on right. student count and and enrollment and enrollment students and needs. Right. So. Those are the major pieces, right? Did you have it's anything else? Money. To it's a lot of interest about all our buses. Hundred thousand in interest. There's no half of our buses. Yeah, that's more buses. What did you say? I was saying the the increase in all the interest, like some of it being double, some of it being quadruple. We've got a hundred thousand, hundred and one thousand that paid for half of our muscles, which was two of two. I thought the the interest. I thought we I was just the hundred one thousand was on the general was on the general fund side. Right. The um the bus expense was the PI fund. Right. right. Different fund. Yeah. Yeah. I it was it you can't move them across. <laughs> I keep trying. It's tempting to do that, but you can't do that. Sadly, we can't. Well, so we had all that extra money that Daphne was talking about with the interest spike. Yeah. But different fund. And there is, I mean, there is, there is strategy that we engage in in terms of when the money gets pulled for the investment fees, because with the rates where they are right now and knowing the uh, funding issues that we've had on the, on the phase two side, we want to keep that money there as long as we can to maximize that interest because right. the general fund can, can handle it. Um, so we're doing that, but we have to make sure that at the end of each fiscal year, because we could, what we'll call, we'll say true up and take the money because we have two different investment groups, one handling the general fund side, well, really all funds, and another group that's handling just the, the bond issue right. funds. So we have all these separate accounts with all these maturities that are, you know, that are there, and we'll pull it to, into our account. Um, and we could do that on a monthly basis, but with that one, we don't want to do that because we want to maximize the, the earnings as much as we can. But we're going to make sure that we do that at least by the end of the fiscal year. So at the end of fiscal year, we get the money in the right account, but that we're still getting as much interest as we can. So then maybe we can go back and start chipping away at some of the projects that we had to pull off on. Right. And they purposely had pretty short uh, maturities on the, some of the fun, you know, you kind of arbitrage, but. So that we, with in a rising rate market, you want it to mature so that you can reinvest it at a higher amount, right? And and ladder it so that different amounts are doing different um, maturities and different time frames. So there's a whole strategy in it. Yeah, yeah. we got we got a team on it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or concerns uh, to raise about the September financials? All right. So the last start we have is the big one. So it's the, the forecast conversation. So I don't know if you, anybody wanted to take a quick break before we start into that. We'll just leave and come back, right? <laughs> Let's keep going, okay. right? Yeah, and you need to get up and leave, feel free. Come back. Except me, I just don't keep driving. Right? <laughs> That's right. Keep driving. <laughs> That's okay. You need a break. <laughs> I asked Jill if I could take the water, then we were there. <laughs> Not sure I got water. Yeah. Oh, you're right. there, there's one. Jill, Jill, Jill. No, no, no. I don't need one. I'm good. I'm actually getting ready to get some help. Okay. Well, we'll we'll jump in. So this is okay. the the November forecast. Um, is is the the board members there are two times that we file a five year forecast. November is this is the initial forecast for this year. Um, so this is FY23 through FY27 where May was the update, but in May, that's where we took the, the budget requests for the next year. So the budgets that are in place, that are part of the appropriation, appropriation resolution that the board approved in June, that is what is the baseline for FY23 now. And then all of the growth that we have into that factors in through the remaining four years through FY27. So 
what I'm saying is come next year as we start looking into our, our different ways of budgeting. And uh, I think the words that we're talking about as we get into the strategic budgeting um, model that we want to put in place, we're going to see how we build this change. That's going to be different. You're, you're still going to see the same number, you know, the same information, but how we build it is going to be drastically different because we're looking at aligning our resources to the strategic priorities of the district. Um, so that's what's going to be different from how we put this put this together. Because if without that, without you know Tracy and I working together on this, I could present a bunch of numbers. But if I don't understand what we're trying to do academically, programmatically, they're just a bunch of numbers on a page that don't mean anything. So we've got to bring those together, marry those two to um, give you give even how we're allocating our resources to support those goals. Um, the ORC or in the Ohio Revised Code and the Ohio Administrative Code requirements. Like I said, we submit these in November and May of each year. Go through these kind of quickly. It's, you know, obviously the purpose is it's to you know engage in long-term planning and discussion of the financial issues facing the district. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, it also is the basis for what I sign off on is what's called the 412 certificate to make sure we have enough money to fund the contracts and arrangements that we um, enter into with vendors in our, in our association groups. It also gives the ODE a method to look if they see financial distress coming, they're gonna, they're gonna they put districts on notice. Um, they put them on fiscal caution, fiscal watch, fiscal emergency. I don't think, I have no intention of us ever getting to that point, but that's, that's what they do when they look at this. Um, the bad part of this is, it's it's a little bit of what we'll call art art and science um, because the, the tough thing is once we put this together I can guarantee you that the numbers in it change um, the prices of the gas pump are different um, we're looking at changes that we're going to go back and talk to the insurance committee about so this forecast could have a significant variance based on um, the outcomes and decisions of, of that one so we're always looking at it and that's why you have the variance report because I'm always looking at our actuals in relationship to how we're projecting our money to come in and how we're projecting our expenses to go out the door. We're looking at that to make sure that everything's on, on, on target. Uh, it's, a, it's a viewed as a key management tool and that's, that's why we look at it. Um, the other piece that we, that we will put out there on the website is the notes and assumptions behind it. We don't want people just to look at the five-year forecast and just look at the numbers in the bottom right-hand corner and see when does it turn negative when you go out of money. Folks need to understand what goes into, into the numbers, what's behind it, what the reappraisal and trying to update numbers look like, um, what does our collection rates look like, what are we projecting for you know, utilities, you know, what, are, what do we think that's going to look like over the next five years, because it could be different from one year to the next. Uh, the key line items, it, the, the five-year forecast is broken up into two sections, it's revenues and expenses. On the revenue side, these are the line items that make that up. Um, and you'll, you'll recognize these because these are the same line items that we talked about in the monthly variance report. It's your general property tax for real estate, it's public utility personal property taxes, unrestricted grants made, restricted grants made, that's our state, that's our state funding. Um, there are certain items that are unrestricted, we can use any way that we want. There are restricted grants and aids that we have to spend money on career tech, disadvantaged pupil impact aid, um, English language learners. Um, other things like that, but those funds have to be spent on certain categories. Um, property tax allocation, that's the homestead rollback payment. Um, this is on existing levies. Uh, that it's a 12.5% credit paid on behalf of the state. That exemption is now gone. So any any new levies, that doesn't, that doesn't apply anymore. So the, unfortunately, the property tax owners are, are paying the full share of that. Um, all other revenue, there were miscellaneous items, then there's total transfers in. Um, and then advances in, transfers in are things that are money's moving in into the forecast. It's a one-time move and it stays there. Advances in, it's a, an accounting timing. Uh, we will have that with, with grants if we need to, that will advance money out, but the money has to come right back in at the end of uh, the beginning of the next fiscal year. A little bit of overview of the, the, on the, the revenue side with the local property taxes. It's the biggest. It's the biggest piece of our revenue. It's our largest revenue source. Sixty-two point eight percent of our total revenue. Property tax collections are ninety-eight point zero one percent, which is great. 
that's you know, was put in here the, the back to normal levels. People are paying their taxes on time. That's pretty good. Um, we anticipate valuation to increase. Uh, we have reappraisal in county year 23. We're projecting class one. And class one is your residential and agricultural properties. We're projecting those values to grow by 6%. Class two is your commercial industrial. We're projecting those to, to, to increase by 4%. Right now, uh, when we look at millage, our class one effective rate is at 38.0852 mills. The class two effective tax rate is 49.2065. We have a total valuation of um, 1,950,986,870. That's our total valuation of the district. House Bill 126, we've, we've talked about this um, before, and this is um, a major change in state law that changed how the board can challenge um, value complaints. Uh, this is where property values are either underfunded um, in terms of the, the sale of a, of a, of a property, and, and, and we do these only on commercial properties. This this property valuation piece has nothing to do with the residential piece. Uh, but if a, if a business was purchased for a million dollars, but it was on the tax duplicate from the auditor for only 750,000, there's that there delta, it's, it's being under taxed. So the Board of Revision um, process, which would change in the House Bill 126, allows us to make sure that we're getting the tax that we're due. And that's what, what 126 did uh, Representative Merritt has introduced this and it's now passed that we engage with legal counsel to make sure that they go out and monitor the sales through an arm length transaction to make sure that it's what each one's willing to sell the property for and, and then um, purchase it for, that those are where they need to be and they monitor that for us. Um, this new process and one of the things we're looking at is to work on a policy that we can bring forward to kind of put that in um, in our bylaws to let people know how we're handling them. Um, we will have to do uh, approvals in um, February. So it changes our notification and approval process that we have to go through as a district. So there's more information that's gonna be coming about changes to that process. Um, you know. Yes. What's the approval, how is that? Who's involved in that and how does that work? But the change in the law is that it will have to come to the board through a formal resolution. So that's yes. <laughs> so that's that's what's changing and that's what will take place in February because right now um look so let's, and let's let's focus when on property, that. We'll, we'll come when back we, we'll come back to that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. All right. Um we do have, we're gonna have a we, there's gonna be a yeah, so about this it'll come both to finance and facilities and to policy committee. Okay, is my <laughs> that yes. Yes. that full Thank conversation. Yeah, that's More not to tonight. Yes, I do. Um, just when we talk about it, then I think it would be good to weave in that education for the community to yes. understand that this isn't us going after businesses; it's us going after what's fair to the students in our district, and. We do this because we don't get enough state funding. And the, it's right, like, and, and this is where I'm trying to understand, and I'm getting a lot of questions from the community on. So I think that would be good for us in the future, not right. for today. Yes, that's that. I would hope that we could do that maybe next month. I'd yeah, like to do that. I've even talked to you about this. I would love I to, that. I'd love to have an educational opportunity to talk about the process, why it's done, mm -hmm. and how it's done, and why it's done. And what um, parameters absolutely. they're using. Yes, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and to do that before we get into the policy piece, but have them follow very closely. Yes. That would be wonderful. Okay. Okay. Um, so the levy, the 4.26 mil, it added a one half year collection because FY22 was the first full year of collection. So that was, we were now seeing that in the forecast as well. Uh, the new fair school funding plan, this is the, the new state funding formula that was in place. Um, we're, we're, we're spot on. Um, there were, it did restore the cuts from FY20 and 21. The student wellness and success funds, which used to be kept track in a separate fund, are now embedded within the general funds. So we had that shift that we've had to, to account for. Um, the biggest change in that for, for districts statewide was that it funded students where they were educated. So they no longer had the deductions for 
with the open enrollment and the community schools and all those changes so that everybody's getting the money for the kids that they're educating. So that was a big, big change. And which is nice because yeah. there was always right. that big number and it didn't benefit our students, right? Right, right. right. Um, the, the, the big challenge that we're going to be facing is that this they're going to be talking about this and voting on the new biennium this in, in next this next summer um the biennium we've got a five-year forecast and a state budget that's only for two years so it, it, at a point in time you may have a forecast that's assuming three different state budgets so we are going sure. to be very involved we're going to be um, reaching out to our legislators to make sure that we're doing everything we can to advocate for the funding that that our students need like we're saying here um Right now, the, the, the challenge that we're, we're seeing is you look across districts statewide, um, 420 districts are on a guarantee again, we're facing, that's being phased in, but that is, that is a challenge. Uh, so in this forecast, we have uh, assumed no increase because we, we are projecting that we'll stay on the guarantee through this forecast. So we're not going to see any new money except the, the phase in that would come in. Um, so that 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 is a big piece that we'll we'll see here um, as we go through that. Um, the other two pieces that we have that I put at the bottom uh, is the the ESSER funds. Uh, ESSER two funds we received four point two million. ESSER three or we also we've got two, two ter terminology challenges we have with this. We're calling it ESSER three, but you may also hear it referred to ARP, ARP ESSER, the American Re um, Recovery Program. So those are ESSER three, ARP ESSER. It's the same thing. Um, so it's the third round that's there, then those funds are drying up and must be spent um, by September 30th, 23 and uh, 24, um, respectively. I have a, I guess, comment question about the Fair School Funding Plan. I mean, my understanding is that the 420 districts that were on the guarantee, again, it's because the Fair School Funding Plan wasn't fully funded. I mean, the goal of, just to be clear, the it's goal right. of Fair School Funding Plan is to eliminate the guarantees and the caps. Correct. But they only approved it for a two-year period. So as of now, there's like a huge gap between what the Fair School Funding Plan would mean ideally mm -hmm. would put in place and what we have right now. And there's no guarantee that they're going to continue down that path or not. This this next state budget is a big one. Uh-huh. Do they have the time to be making major changes and knowing that they have to have the new budget in place by the end of June? Because hasn't it taken them a long time to like revise the model? The, the model is done. Right. But I mean, if they were making major revisions to it, would we really expect that to happen question, in this next? I don't think it's a question of revision. It's a question of do they continue they forward it. with it or do they not? Okay. And it's unknown. Right. And if they didn't, would they fall back on the previous model? Don't know that. That's the unknown it's, piece. They would have it. to do something to change it, but a lot will depend on um, mm -hmm. who's who's in who sits right. in the positions to make the those decisions at the state right. level. So so in addition to us being involved as a district along with other districts, when as it gets closer to that time, we could also educate our community as to what they can do. Uh, in terms of reaching out and yeah. the importance of what that state budget is to them. Right. And if this one's small on my screen, I know it's small on the screen up there. <laughs> um, so th this is just, this is this is a snapshot. This page and the next are just from the October payment. We've received payments twice a month so that you can see how that, that gets broken down from for pupil amounts to special ed students to disadvantaged pupil impact aid, uh, the English learners gifted, the career tech gift was one of us, and then smoke and enrollment piece, which it's not there. We don't we don't, we don't have any. Um, so you can see this just to show the calculation of breakdowns because there's a lot that goes into that different weighting based on the type of, um, for example, for special education, the, the, the level of disability that the student has. There's additional weighting that's, that's calculated with that. Is this the top report? Is that what this is? This is the, the state fund, um, the SFPR, it's the school funding payment report. This is how the state calculates. Yeah, how much we get. I'm just, I guess what I'm trying to, if somebody actually wanted to see this, they could go to the state 
they could go to the Department of Education website. Yes, and there's there's actually I didn't put in this presentation, but there's actually a really really great document the ODEs put out that is a line by line explanation, and I want to put that out as a resource for yeah. our community oh, on great. our website. So. Those are things from a communication standpoint that I want to do from the financial side to really put that stuff out there to give people access to it, right. you know, hoping that they go look at it. But it's it, it's a great document yep. uh, that will give them that detail. Um, just, well, just some other pieces on the revenue side. Um, you know, the learning model you know impacted food service, and you know, as we we we'll look through that, we talked. Um, we talked earlier in my update. I talked with you. I didn't talk here. Um, so one of the things that's on Thursday's agenda is um, the transfer from the my tummy fund to food service. We've got some some negative balances that we're dealing with, um, inability to, to pay. Um, so there's some issues that we're dealing with there. But those are some things that we can do to help um, offset those. If not, that might be something that we we, we may have to look at maybe a transfer from the general fund um, to help pay those those debts if we need to. Um, the budget reserve piece, this is a, a conversation or some information today that I shared. Um, it was um, an issue that we talked that was uh, addressed, identified in FY21, um, and it was changed in the May forecast. The budget reserve calculation that we had is in line with, with ORC uh, that is five, no, no greater than 5% of the previous year's total revenue one of the ways that we're going to look to um, have more options with this is, a, is, a, is another policy that we can do that may give us greater flexibility to um, be in charge of what we want that reserve to look like in the calculation. We've talked about 60 days is the best practice. This, this ORC calculation um, won't allow that as we get towards the end of the of the forecast. So if we change that policy, that'll allow us to. It would be great to change that policy to be in line with our fiscal beliefs. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that that that's coming. Um, so I've got a huge packet of information on that that we'll start digging into so we can come up with policy that exactly as Bill said, you know, aligns with our fiscal beliefs. And just to be clear, I mean the reason that we had established a fiscal belief that it was important to have a certain balance on hand was so that in the event of something extraordinary happening, we want to make sure that our staff can be paid, right? And yep. I mean, it's, it was in alignment with the best <laughs> yeah. practices. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Kind of important. <laughs> yes. It wasn't to, to hold on to money for any other purpose. It um, was simply to be in line with best practices. Yes. So that we have a, a policy that will report in the committee as a policy and then the report for approval. So when you look at the total revenue for FY23, um, all of the local sources uh, in addition, you know, including the real estate taxes, it's 81.4% of our revenue. So we're very locally uh, dependent on our revenue. Uh, the state remains, contributes the remaining 18.6% for 23. You can just see it here. Bar graph mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the challenges that we talked about, obviously, I, I had mentioned that the fair school funding plan, well, we're projected to be on the guarantee, we're on the guarantee, and it's likely not to change. Total revenue is estimated to grow less than 1% over the next five years. As we get into the remaining slides, we'll start talking about the expenses. This is where um, we talk about the financial issues that may arise. This is the first one that we're going to, to see when you're looking at your revenue growing by 1% over five years compared to an annual growth rate of 5% for your expenses. We will move into deficit spending next fiscal year in 24. So that is the first, the first red flag that we have. So we need to be um, aware of that um, and very cautious about that because we, as soon as you start spending down your cash balance, as soon as you start spending more than you have coming in, you're you're eating away at that cash balance, and then we're going to have to look at options to um, rectify that. Um, so on the expenditure side, here are the lines that we talk about each month as part of the variance report. Again, personal services, retirement, and insurance benefits. 
purchase services, supplies and materials, capital outlay or equipment, it's interchangeable, um, missed other objects, transfers out and advances out, those correspond with the transfers and advances that you have on the revenue side, then the totals. Um, major drivers here, um, in inflation, that's a that's a major, major issue going on right now. Uh, a 40 year high in our economy at this time, increased inflation assumptions, um, you know, to be somewhere between three and five percent due to uh, the current economic conditions that we're that we're dealing with. We're looking at our, our program offerings. Uh, we're looking at our facility, our cost, the utilities, uh, the bus fuel that we talked about that's running that you know twenty five percent higher than we thought. Which gas prices are extremely high still. So we're we're we're, we're faced with with those issues. Um, we also have our enrollment, you know, whether it's increasing or decreasing. We, you know, as Joe mentioned, we looked at, we were looking at the enrollment numbers to figure out what should we be accounting for when it gets into staffing, because we need to make sure that growth and enrollment, that we've got the growth and staffing to accommodate the needs of those new students in the, in the schools, in the grades that we need them in. Uh, so we're factoring those pieces in as well. This is the, the breakdown of the total expenditures for FY23. When you take the wages and benefits together, we're at 82.51% of the general fund is spent on, on personnel. I mean, it's people business, it's what we do. That's that's not out of line. Um, it's it's what we would expect. Again, another bar chart here just showing a breakdown of those categories. Um, wages being at the bottom in red, um, benefits above that, and then the others get real small because. When you're making up that remaining, you know, less than 18 percent, they're going to represent a very small part of, of this. But again, that average growth over time is growing at five percent. Staffing plan here's this, and I'm going to turn this over to Jill to talk about staffing. Sure. Um, okay, so um, when we are looking at making decisions about our um, projected staffing needs, we uh, always start with our enrollment study. And, um, you know, the enrollment study, though, scientific with calculations and looking at birth, you know, historical data and enrollment numbers and birth data, um, it is just still always an estimate. Um, and so our staffing um, needs are also an estimate, as we've talked about the last couple finance meetings, we've um, had some adjustments that we've need, needed to make um, based on student needs and, and enrollment. So when we started looking at updating this portion of the five-year forecast, um, we went and we checked out the recommended enrollment, the moderate, the high projections, just to kind of, um, you know, take a look at what's the best plan for us. Um, so that, as I said before, we're not continually coming back needing more. Um, we did, when we did the five-year forecast previously, we we were, went strictly off the recommended numbers and we're finding that that's, you know, didn't play out well for us as, as we have been discussing. So what we've decided to do for this five-year forecast, um, which also was um, taken into consideration when we were doing some planning for the high school and such with phase two projects, is we have forecasted based on the high projections. Um, so I um, have a supporting document that I wanted to pass around for the board. Um, you guys wanna, you wanna pass it around. Um, what you'll see on this particular chart is FY23 is, is, is our current year, right? It's the 22-23 school year. So we have updated those numbers to align with um, the position increases that we have had for this school year. Um, including the positions we talked about tonight, including the COO position, including you know all of those positions we previously discussed. The chart you have in front of you is five years forward. So you'll see 23, 24. It's our increase that we're expected to have with the high projections for the 23, 24 school year, 25 or 24, 25, 25, 26, and so on. So you really could kind of take a, a pencil and draw a line between 26, 27 and 27, 28. That's a little bit of foreshadowing for the next five-year forecast. Um, but essentially um, went through and looked at the projected increases by grade band. Um, so if you're looking at 23, 24, the high enrollment projection has us increasing 100 students at the K-5 level um, for next school year. 
that would, if divided out 25 kids per class approximately, and it doesn't always play that nicely, that's approximately four, four staff needed for next school year at that grade band. Then you can kind of go down the row and see um, how things change. You know, interestingly enough, um, we're projected to lose a little bit at 6-8 based on the high projections. And so you'll notice that little asterisk underneath the chart that I said, I didn't reduce any staff just to be cautious on, on the year that we, um, you know, we're, we're projected to lose. Um, so you can see for 23-24, then we have um, eight certified staff um, that we would, you know, like to forecast to need to bring in. And then as you work across the chart, you see how it plays out for the, the following years. Um, down below, based on the enrollment projections, um, we, are, we are forecasted to get 775 new students over this five-year span in this chart. Again, remember this current five-year forecast ends at 26, 27, and this is based on high projections. Um, so what we did was we totaled up the gen ed um, teachers needed, and that would be 31 new staff over, you know, those next five years. Um, then for special education and EL, we look at our, our percentage of our population that fall into those categories. So you can see for special education, it's, a, it's about 15% of our students. Um, so that would be an increase of about 116. We kind of divided that by an average caseload. Um, but again, those are kind of the anomalies that come into place, you know, with the, with wherever kids fall, right? So if you're looking at the K-5 number again, that's assuming 25 kids go into one school and we're going to hire one teacher, but really those 25 kids are going to be sp spread across the district. So it's really a, a numbers game of where do we really need to add, but this is kind of our best, you know, projection for, for how to plan for staffing. Um, so special education looks at an increase of 11 special education teachers for aids for units. Um, and then if you look at our EL um, projections, we're sitting at about 6% of our student population um, is identified as our English learner um, group. And so that's you know roughly two teachers and one alternative instructor over the course of this five years. So after taking a look at these, I've had a chance to sit down with Sue. I sat down with Tia. We looked at their projections based on what they were seeing. And, um, you know, it, it falls right in line with special ed, especially with what we're predicting based on the high projections. Um, you can see if we go back and look at the moderate numbers, um, you know, it's it, it doesn't feel comfortable. I mean, it's a it's a little low. And so we really do feel like, you know, to, to be safe, we really need to be planning for those high projections. Um, and, you know, it would be great if it doesn't play out this way necessarily, but um, to be safe, that's what Scott has worked into the five-year forecast. So this chart um, you'll see has those updated numbers. Um, FY23, of course, again, is what we already have in place or in the plan for this school year. And then the next four years planned out um, based on those high projections. What percentages did you use for, like, I know you said it's 6% for EL and 15% for special ed, mm -hmm. but is, is that the trend line? Like, how what did you up with that percentage? Like, how did, because I, I think, and I didn't go back through your enrollment trend, but I thought that percentage was increasing um, as yeah. a percent to the total. Is yes. it not? So, um, so I haven't done the calculations on that trend analysis yet either. But for instance, I know the last time we looked at the special education projections, it was actually 17%. Mm -hmm. So it falls in that, you know, from what I've seen, that 15 to 17%. Um, and EL has been a little bit of an increase mm -hmm. um, over the last few years, but it's it's just basically a, a calculation of over the last few years, our percentage of special education compared to the regular um, regular enrollment numbers that that's the only wondering. thing that i'm saying is should be higher well i'm just saying what's the trend and are we continuing it yeah. are we continuing the trend or are we taking an average of what it is because mm -hmm. that would also be what would get us is yeah. mm -hmm. you know the seeing if, if if we'd underestimate what they those needed. subgroups of those subgroups right. and that is going to have a much bigger impact on right. ratios and sure. the numbers. Sure. So to, that was one of the reasons why we were talking about just Looking the enrollment those, yeah. trend, you know, mm -hmm. has been so that we could factor right. that That's in. The history of that. 
what we requested because I, I feel like it's gone. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the mix so issue that. is going to be a different cost base. So like how can we make sure that we're, I mean, like, like you said, it's it's so many levels of numbers layered sure. on top sure. of each other. Mm -hmm. But if we can start with some assumptions of saying, okay, we're expecting it to increase. Mm -hmm. And because of that, this is what we're building in because that will really show us where the pressure point is going right. to be even more. And I think that's, we need to have a little bit more granular view mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So we're 17% we're now and we're projecting 15%. No, we're at 15% right now. Oh, we are. Yeah, I thought I heard last time, okay. like the last time we were doing oh, this model. Gotcha. Sorry. And, and this by using, using our approach of the high, high projections, high projections it, it's, it's not huge, but it gives us a little bit of flexibility that if we don't yeah. need, say, you know, a K-5 teacher, but we've got an increased special ed population greater than that 50%. We can we might sure. be able to not hire here, but but build. Oh know, sure. So, so we've got Absolutely. some of that. And that's why we did this so that we had right. that flexibility to do it. Because if we don't need to do it, we're, we're, we're not. We're oh, no, right. Exactly. No. But we want to make sure we would rather plan for the worst case scenario. If you want, I hate it's not. It isn't the worst case, but you know, the from, from a cost from a growth growth that's there. We'd rather have that plan there because what we don't want to do is have to come back to the committee and go, oh, we need we need another point eight five. We don't we want to have the plan right so that we can go do what we need to do, be nimble and flexible enough to get the services to those kids as quickly right. as, they, as they show right. up. So. And that was, you know, when we looked, I think I mentioned looking at the moderate numbers, you know, that was bringing in only 3.5 special education teachers over the course of the next five years, which really didn't feel right. So <laughs> no. when Sue was yeah. looking at her projections, right. she was kind of looking at her historical trend and that fell closer, it, not quite to the high projections. So we felt like the high projections gave us a little bit of cushion, but it was closer to the high projections. Right. So, I mean, we just kind of discussed that we thought that really going with the high projections is our best guess at giving us the cushion we need. Well, and from a planning perspective, because of the lead time it takes to change our revenue, right? Right. You almost have to look at it that right. way, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll update the enrollment study every couple of years. Right. And so, you know, these numbers could fluctuate again, but um, I do feel like at this point in time, this is our best. And, and I, I do want to commend Jill and, and Tracy and the entire team um, because I couldn't put together a forecast, like I said, without knowing what, no, what we're trying to do for our well, This is the strategy. This is it. Right. This is the strategy right. piece and the willingness and openness of, of the team to sit down and talk about the finances and talk about the methodology and all be in the same room and know what we're doing that we're not we're not making these decisions in these in a vacuum of these silos that we're, we're we're putting the issues on the table talk about it, figure out what it is so that we can present the best realistic picture to to you it's awesome i mean it's you know i wish that you know there was more money in there but it's it, we're putting the resources where where our where our kids and our community needs it and we're, we're working on that together and that's just it's really cool it's really powerful so, so I think, you know, the lesson learned was the, the strategy used last time was to go with the recommended and we learned that that didn't work for us. So going with the high projection is, you know, hopefully gonna, you know, play out better for us. Um, I also wanted to point out, point out that, you know, we have um, quite a few ESSER positions that we've talked about um, in pre at previous meetings. And that funding will um, only take us through the 23-24 school year. And so actually just today in cabinet, um, you know, I kind of presented a model for how, for how we'll go through the decision-making process for which position we think should be worked into the five-year forecast. At this point in time, the five-year forecast only has a few positions that are currently paid from ESSER funds in it. Those would be like we have four certified teachers that are paid for out of ESSER funds. We planned you know, five-year forecast cycles below before they're already included in the FY25 numbers and have been. Um, so we've got a couple of those things already worked in, but the bulk of those positions, we're going to have some really tough decision-making um, to do. We're sitting at um, 38.5 positions 
because what the number was. it was third. That's not including the teachers that you were talking about, the four teachers, or it is. It does include okay. those four teachers. Um, we were at 33.5, and then we have some, some separate ARP IDAB funds and early childhood funds that actually um, only had some positions staffed through this school year. So we ended up including those for one year into ESSER 3 so that we can make these decisions about all these positions together. And that's right. what puts us at 38.5 um, decision-making times. So um, I have one other question related to that, and it's the not, I don't, I, I'm going to ask the question. Um, I mean, we're we've got to talk about it from the numbers perspective. Do those individual people know okay. that their positions are funded that way and know? Yeah. Um, when they were hired, we were very transparent, and we have to remind people often um, about um, the temporary funding that we have for those positions. Um, the tricky thing is, though, that some of those positions are um, hired through the ESC, um, and some are actually like GJEA positions. So, for instance, our mental health liaisons were hired on as GJEA, you know, members. Well, they're positions that are in the, the bargaining unit. So, if we were to get rid of those positions, let's just say that doesn't mean those people are necessarily the ones that would be ripped because then the seniority piece kicks mm -hmm. into play. So, you know, that's that's gonna be a, a tricky part of the process as well. Which is why we're using, we're using data pieces to triangulate some information as to the impact of the programming and the position. Mm -hmm. So we can appreciate all of our staff are valuable to us, right. um, but we can appreciate exactly what that position brings to our students and, um, find a way to, to keep them if we can show a really clear in. So, so Jill has outlined a um, process for evaluating, having discussions, being transparent, collecting the data, asking for more. Uh, and we hope that by mid next year, mm -hmm. We would be able to communicate to the staff which positions will we will be able to keep and which ones we will not. And that communication, because some of those positions are bargaining unit positions that would be subject to yeah. processes, that communication will be going to all staff, not right. just the staff that are at. Right. That. So I think what I hear you saying that. is. I'm just going to stick with the mental health liaison as the example. Sure. If we got rid of those four positions, it wouldn't just be the people in those positions right. that are learning that we're getting rid of it. It would be more of a, a communication that's district wide because it yes. doesn't impact people outside of those positions. Right. It wouldn't yes. necessarily be the people who were hired to fill those Correct. positions because they're they are bargaining unit positions that would have to follow the contract process, mm -hmm. which is based on seniority. Right. Wow, so I didn't think about that when we approved those ESSER positions. Well, not they, many of that. Well, not many of them are um, GJEA positions. They have unique certifications. Yeah. As well. So there's a lot at play with that. Yep. There's a there's a lot that way. And that impacts after 23, 24. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So on this mental health needs. I hear, I'm not looking into this, and so, but there's grant funding out there connected to mental health support in schools. Have we looked into, or are we looking into, if the grant funding could apply to those? We have not yet, but we certainly will. Good to know. So the only thing that you have built into the staffing or the four teachers. Is that what I'm hearing? Four. No. Um, the four certified teachers, um, one campus supervisor at the high school. Um, and that right now. So that's five of 38. Of 38.5. Of 38.5. Oh, I'm sorry. We also have. Um, the one OT from the ARP IDA B funds that we've carried over, we have that one coming into play um, as well. Really good. 
And we've also are, seen increased yes. attrition, though, too, in our district. And you remember how many mm -hmm. openings we had because of attrition. So, I mean, they, I think we are being purposeful in having these conversations. I remain hopeful, and it sounds much worse than how it's going to play out in the end. The right, right. Well, that's on individual people yes. versus yes. the actual number of positions, yes. which exactly. is always the case that you hope yep. that that will balance out. That's right. That's right. right. Yes. And I love your focus on the data, the measurement that tells the story. Right. right. It's important. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. We're in the home stretch here. Yeah. So when we look at this, I I mentioned deficit spending in, in, in fiscal year 24. So what you have here on this graph, um, the blue line is our, our revenues, red line are expend expenditures, the green line is the corresponding ending cash balance, and then that purple line at the bottom. Let's see on the screen. Okay. Um, is the 60 days cash ratio that we talk about that's part of our fiscal beliefs that we, we want to do. But um, you can see that in 24, we're began spending more than we have coming in uh, to the tune of $2.8 million uh, dollars in 24. That's the deficit spending number that we're looking at. Then it drops to, um, we do our projecting. So the first red flag is that deficit spending in FY24. Um, the second which, red flag is which like, could be cut in half almost if the premiums are adjusting. True. Yes. So the second red flag is when we dip below that 60 days cash balance. Just so you'll see that in um, FY26. Um, I did have that on the slide, so I, should, I was talking before I. Uh, went too far. So this is the, the forecast summary, so I'll get to that slide. This is, uh, as I mentioned here, in 24, you'll see on line 6.010, that's where the uh, 2.8 million we're spending more than we have coming in that fiscal year. So we're projecting uh, an unreserved fund balance positive through FY26 in the May 2022 forecast that we brought forward. Our cash balance has improved. So at that point in time, we were projecting an $800,000 um, unreserved fund balance. So we 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 picked up some. So it, it hasn't changed when the deficit is projected to occur, but it it, it softened that a little bit. Um, but you know the the big thing we have to look at is that deficit spending um, in 24. Really totally on the screen. Um, so that's that 2.8 million dollar. Um, um, the second red flag, and I, I missed a slide here. Um, the second red flag, and I'll point to it on the screen, is in FY26. That's the first year that we dip below that 60 days cash. The third red flag, and this is the one that we can't do anything about, is um, the unreserved fund balance. We go negative in FY27. Um, it, it, that, that it's too late at that point. We can't end, we can't end here. Um, you know, in a, in a negative fund balance. So that's that's where we are. We, we, we've identified what some of the issues are that we're, we have coming up. Um, I think the questions and the conversation we have from the insurance committee, there's there some some things that we need to go back and, and look into, dig deeper into, bring a, bring a solution to the board um, it, next month with a revised forecast that incorporates those changes into it. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna do that and hopefully make this picture look a little bit better. But we still have to be aware, you know, Jack, we just said it, you know, even if we make those changes, we're not gonna, we're not gonna eliminate, we're not gonna eliminate the spending deficit or the deficit that's projected in, in 27, but we can we can do what we can now, take the steps that we need to now to avoid that later. Um, so we won't, we don't want to wait until it's too late. Um, but like that. Uh, then just oh, this is just the last one. While well, you're doing that, but the, the thing that we need to make sure we all understand around the table and and hopefully educate our community is our um, our revenue isn't is is one percent increases, right? So it's fixed from the last seven. It'll be seven years, right? From 2020, which would have been our last levy, but our 
can our our expenses are increasing with inflation. So five percent and our growth, right? So we've at, we're, we potentially can add seven hundred and fifty. 770 kids and our revenue doesn't change and right the negotiation this i was just going to say and yeah. but our expenses are going up five percent every time so the the crazy state of ohio relies on local funding for the most right of, of education on property tax and we work as hard as we can to to have those that projected revenue last as long as we can right and when i went to a, a course on school finance through the osba five years is kind of like the goal right we're going to make seven hopefully before we need a new revenue source to kick in but managing expenses and and but growth you have no control over, right we have all that land in jefferson township that we can't control how quickly they put up houses and how quickly families move in. So um, it's it's hard being on the school board and understanding that your income is is relatively fixed, but your expenses you have no control over based on the number of students and 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 negotiated well, negotiated costs you do, but. You also want to have a, a delivery. You've got to be able to retain staff. You have to retain staff, There's... right? And and the education industry is going through so much attack right now that keeping staff and and Shay's miracle work of getting staff to fill all the seats um, it just is very difficult. Yeah. So. We just take all this very seriously. I'm sorry. Municipalities have income tax. So when right. wages rise with inflation, so too does their tax base, but not ours. Right. right. So the city yeah, income tax income floats with your revenue income. Mm -hmm. Our property taxes are fixed. Mm -hmm. And even though I know you had a slide that said the appraisal may come in at 6% higher or something, the reappraisal. It doesn't matter. It's really 35% of that, right? Because the tax base valuation is 35% of the assessed value. So, and the assessed value is is 85% of market value. So, I mean, if you extrapolate all of those reductions, it's really going to be maybe a 35% or 0.35% increase in of the reappraisal impact to the uh, actual numbers. Does that make sense? So, we, so, so the only thing that doesn't make sense to me, I understand all of those pieces, but on fiscal year 2023, we're showing a decrease in total revenue. That's what, yeah, so that's our, our, our base looks a little hokey for 2023 that we're building off of. Right. So revenues are actually down, um, or we're projecting to have them be down, and expenses are up 8.3%. So our base year that we're building everything off of the five-year forecast, I think we need to kind of explain, you know, not necessarily tonight, but I'd like to understand what the drivers are that because that's our base year that we're forecasting off of. That and that's when I was going over that, that earlier. Huh? Can you address it now, Scott? Or do you, do you know why? Yeah. There, there's going to be a lot of pieces to that, but I can go through and, and pull that back and obviously send it to the board, but obviously do that as part of the next update because there were changes that we did. Um, we had very tough conversations about looking at the board revision piece and the change of law and what that's going to do. Are we going to, are we going to stay at the same level of um, revenue coming in from those, from what we had in the past? So there are some adjustments for that. Right. Um, so I think that would have been a good slide to add in here. Um, I mean, to me, that was the, the most questioning parts 
you know, I, I got all the assumptions, but it was like, what changed and how much is the Delta? Because I couldn't find my April forecast of what the base year was. Just to say, what changed so much between that and 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 now? Um, yep. You know, personnel services are going. Board of Revisions uh, doesn't give us three million dollars. No, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not saying that was the whole oh, thing. There's, right, there's but on the of, on the expense on the expense that... side too, we we're talking about personnel services are up eight point two percent. But then we talked earlier about money was taken out of that and actually put to ESSER, so it's even a bigger increase. If that is if if that's true that we took out part and put to ESSER. So, I mean, there was just some pieces, and then if everything's built off of this year, um, it just didn't. Did I just you had gross it up on the five-year forecast to include that 777 that was moved? I mean, because, if, I mean, last year's forecast, in, in July, you probably wouldn't have subtracted 777 from the model. We did not. It's only right. on the actuals. Right. Right. Yeah. So this model was separate and distinct from the the accounting system. So what what I what I'll do is because I, I have oh, sorry. with with within so. within the spreadsheet I have what those changes were mm -hmm. from May to now. Mm -hmm. I should have hindsight twenty twenty. I should it would made, be helpful. I should have made that a slide. Know. Yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah. So I apologize yeah. for that. So what yeah. I'll do is yeah. I will get that out is to the board, but I will also make sure that when I bring this back to the committee in November, mm -hmm. that I have it on here as well. So you'll get it, but also bring it back here so that, you know, everybody can hear the, the right. all of the details too. That, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I had a question about that. It's just the card that was... So this is this is like month one, and that's why we do it over a two month period because right. it is such a huge beast, right? And so we have another finance and facility committee meeting prior to voting in the November board meeting on the submission. So I think it really helps to have it cover a two, right. two meeting yeah. process. Gives gives folks time to digest it. If there's other you know questions you have, concerns, send let me know. Um, we'll work and see if we can get this out on the website so that the presentation and the forecast itself are there so that folks can see that. Um, and then obviously if they've got questions, things like that, you know, obviously we're here. Great. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Other than the adjournment? All right. I will adjourn the meeting um, at 8.40.30. Thank you all for all of your great questions. Um, all right, Daniel, what happened? I was a lot. 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 I was a lot